to the preaching time. I was going to say preaching hours, but I don't want to scare you. So uh, preaching time or preaching hour. And uh, turn with me this morning uh, to 1 Kings uh, chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, to me, uh, this is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And uh, a lot of Sunday school stories are said about this character. And we're going to talk a little bit about him and bring out a, a message through one of the things that he, that he himself went through. So, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And I'm sure many of us could say the same thing today, that uh, people have forsaken the Lord God. We're not to the point where they're slaying the prophets. They've done in time past. But if the Lord doesn't, if the Lord tarries much longer, I believe we will see those days too. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that the message this morning be a blessing to your people and to the heart of your people, O oh God, that you may minister to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may see things this morning that we need to see, that you may uh, meet us where we're at and uh, convict us to where you want us to be and comfort us and strengthen us in these, uh, in these trying days, Lord God, and help us to rejoice in you, Father, and to know that you are there with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are our God, and you always, with a watchful eye, keep us in under the shadow of your wings, and help us, Lord God, to remain in that secure place, and help us this morning to learn something of you, and to be strengthened through the word that is, will be preached shortly. We pray and ask these things in the most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Elijah was one of the most famous Old Testament prophets. Uh, you'd say he would rank up there with Moses. Perhaps him and Elijah. Elijah and Moses were the two greatest prophets uh, that Israel had uh, witnessed in the Old Testament. Elijah's name means Jehovah is my God. And Elijah was, comes from the, the land of Gilead. If you remember through our study in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Exodus, we said the land of Gilead was to the east of the Jordan River, inherited by the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh. He's particularly from a place called Tishba, and therefore he's called Elijah the Tishbite. We are not given any more information regarding from which tribe he is descended or from which town, which, uh, or what any, anything of his lineage, but we know that he was from Gilead and he was from Tishba. And Elijah was sent by God to rebuke King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who brought wholesale Satanism into Israel. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, they made it the religion of the land in that day. And Jezebel was a wicked queen, and she was on a crusade to kill all the prophets of God. Elijah's greatest feat, we know, occurred when he challenged the prophets of Baal to a showdown on Mount Carmel, that he may prove to the children of Israel who was the one and true God. Was it Baal, or was it the God of Israel? And Elijah asked the prophets of Baal to build their altar to their God, and he would build his altar to his God, and then, then he'd say the one true God would answer their prayer. The prophets of Baal would pray to God, and Elijah would pray to God, and the true God would answer the prayer and send fire from down and burn the, uh, the sacrifice on the altar. And the prophets of Baal prayed to their God, and they chanted all day and all night. And then when evening came, uh, no answer came from their God. And they jumped up and down their altar and they cut themselves. And uh, the Bible says that the blood gushed all over their altar. And they were still praying and crying to their God. And guess what? Crickets. No answer. No answer. And then finally, it was Elijah's turn. And he called them and he said, bring me water and they poured water all over the altar and he said dig a ditch and fill that ditch with water now remember there was a drought in Israel in, day, in that day and water was a very precious commodity then after he had drenched the entire altar and the sacrifice and surrounding 
the soil and the ditch filled with water. Elijah prayed to God and immediately fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood, consumed the stones and all the water was gone. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Kings 18.38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Scorched earth with little piece of land with nothing left. God consumed everything. Everything was gone. The stones, the wood, imagine that. If you were there and you watched this, whoosh, fire from heaven, everything was gone. And then in 1 Kings 18, 39, the Bible says, And then when the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. They were so far gone that they didn't understand that their God was the one true God. And right after this contest, Elijah commanded to slay all of Baal's prophets. And that's what should be done with false prophets. I have to be careful here, because I know we live in a dispensation of grace, but they ought to be slain, because they are teaching the people to, to, to swerve or to stray from God. And then when Jezebel heard of the slaughter, she was angry, and she swore to have Elijah killed. And when Elijah heard, he heard this news, uh, Jezebel was after him, he fled for his life. The Bible tells, of, tells us he first went to Beersheba, and he left his servant there. And then he went a day's journey into the wilderness, likely the Negev. And there God strengthened him and fed him and, and gave him drink. And the Bible says he walked 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Mount Horeb, which was also Mount Sinai. The Bible says he found a cave there and he sat and he began to mope, considering his lot in life, wondering if it was worth it all. And then God asks him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah responded, I, even I only, am left. Now, we can presume that Elijah was feeling lonely. But not only was he feeling lonely, but he was downright feeling uh, completely uh, abandoned and completely alone, no one around him. He actually believed he was the only one left in the nation of Israel who was serving God. In one moment, he had one of the greatest victories that we are recorded in the Old Testament. In another, he is down in, a, in one of the greatest funks that he, in his life. He had defeated the prophets of Baal in one of the most memorable showdowns ever. And instead of being congratulated, he was hunted like an animal by Jezebel. But we have to remind ourselves, James 5.17 uh, gives us the humanity of Elijah. Even though he was a great prophet, he was still a man. James says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And sometimes we too can get into a state where we wonder, is it worth it all? Is what I'm doing worth it all? Has, any, has my work or my labor in the Lord made any difference? Elijah felt depressed and dejected. He felt alone. Now loneliness is a big problem in today's society. Loneliness is a state of mind linked to wanting human contact but feeling alone. People can be alone and not feel lonely. They can have contact with people and still experience feelings of isolation and loneliness. Psychologists tell us there are many contributing factors that causes one to feel lonely, such as physical isolation, moving to a new location, divorce, death of someone, uh, someone significant in your life. They tell us that loneliness can affect your health, both mental and physical. It can cause heart problems, depression, higher stress levels, decreased memory, risk of substance abuse, and even affect brain function. And loneliness also affects uh, people differently during, the, during different stages of life. A child who struggles to make friends at school will feel lonely. A college freshman might feel lonely despite being surrounded by roommates and other peers because he doesn't fit he doesn't feel like he fits in. A soldier might feel lonely. A young soldier might feel lonely when he is deployed to a foreign, the foreign country despite being surrounded by other fellow soldiers. An older adult who's lo who loses a spouse may feel lonely. If that would happen to my dad. And after my mom passed away within a year, a uh, year after my mom passed away, my dad remarried. I said, Dad, you're rushing. Big mistake he made. Why? Because he was feeling lonely. He didn't want to be by himself. Even in the last year and a half, during these 
lockdowns that had been forced upon us by our governments because of this COVID uh, pandemic. And I do not say that uh, uh, by accident. Uh, the healthcare professionals tell us that they have seen a rise in mental health issues and substance abuse. The cure has become worse than the disease. That's where we're at. The reason is because humans are so social creatures. We need, God has designed us to need social interaction with one another. You can think that you can live alone, but you, 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 it's going to affect you, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not. God has designed you and I this way. You will notice in the passage that it was God who sought Elijah. And it was God who asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? God is always, always asking his wayward children, where are you? What are you doing? Where are you going? Why are you running? Why are you resisting? And these are great questions when you're feeling lonely. You ask yourself, God asks you, where are you? What are you doing? Why have you cut yourself from the people who love you and the God who loves you? You know the expression, out of sight, out of mind. If you isolate yourself, I'm here to tell you that you have no one to blame but yourself. If you choose to isolate yourself, and then you begin feeling lonely and alone and dejected, that nobody cares, nobody wants you. If you've isolated yourself, you have no one to blame but yourself. Now, I'm not talking about life circumstances when uh, parents abandon their children or a spouse may abandon the, their, their partner that they've been married to for a long time. I'm talking about if you purposefully isolate yourself, if you purposefully uh, reject human interaction, it will affect you whether you want to believe it or not. I was having a conversation recently with an individual and he was lamenting that several of us don't keep in touch. Now this person doesn't live near, uh, he doesn't live near here, doesn't live within driving distance. And he was saying, well, why we don't keep in touch, we don't uh, talk to each other, we don't do this, we don't do that. And I asked him the following, I said, uh, how's church? Have you been attending? Did you find a church that, you, uh, that you're going to? Uh, crickets, he didn't say anything, I know what happened. And I, and I made it clear to him, and I was trying to be nice, I didn't want to offend him because he's a, he's a friend. I said, uh, here in our local circle, we keep in touch with each other. It may not be every day, but we call each other, we text each other, we send each other videos, we, 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 we communicate, we get together, we meet. It may not be often, but we, we still keep in touch. The point I was trying to make to him is that you're lamenting that your, your certain circle of friends that you have are, are not communicating, but you're not making an effort to find your, your, yourself a local church that you can be part of. Everyone needs a local church family. You need to belong to a local church family. That's what God has set it up. I mean, I'm not saying this because I want you to be part. I do want you to be part of our local church, if that's where God leads you. But God has set some things in motion. He has established some things. And one of the things that he's established is he wants his children to belong to a local church. In fact, the book of Titus, why was the book of Titus written? Because God wanted Titus to ordain elders in every city in Crete. Why? So they can have local churches of their own. And if you look at the story of Elijah here, as he was sitting in this cave, uh, cave moping and, and, uh, cons and, and contemplating his lot in life, you have to see that it was he who ran away from God. God allowed him to. God, uh, I believe God led him to this mountain. But it was Elijah who ran away. Instead of standing firm and saying to, to Jezebel, you can't touch me because God has protected me, he ran away in fear. And as he was upon Mount Horeb, even though he ran away from God, the thing is God did not forsake him. God went after him. God revealed himself to Elijah. Not in a great wind or an earthquake, but in a still, small voice. God had been there all along undetected by Elijah. And even though you may isolate yourself, God will still find you. Remember what David said, though I hide in, in the highest heaven or the lowest hell, that you are there. God will never forsake his children. Furthermore, when 
Elijah was there alone in the cave, God revealed to Elijah, hey, Elijah, I want to I wanna let you in on a little secret. Uh, I hate to break this to you, Elijah, but you're not the only one. I have reserved unto me 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In fact, at the end of the conversation, God shows him with one of the men, Elisha. He says, I want you to go and you, I want you to find Elisha. And I want you to anoint him to be your successor. That was one of the men that God had reserved him to himself. In fact, in 1 Kings 19, 18, this is how God says it. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Elijah was not alone. What was the problem? He felt he was alone. He thought he was alone. But he was not alone. Loneliness often doesn't come from being alone. Loneliness comes from thinking that you are alone. Thinking that you're the only one who feels this way. When in fact there are thousands of others who feel the same way you do. Remember the human experience is not uh, solely yours. The fact that you're a human being means that others have lived life too. And the things that you're experiencing as a human being uh, are not privy to you. They may be your experience, but they are not, they are not outside the human experience, if that makes any sense. Many of us today are looking around what's going on in our country, especially what's happening in our government and the governments around the world. And it angers us, I'm telling you, be honest with you, it angers me. Injustice. Uh, stupidity. I can't do stupid. I'm sorry. Uh, you may be offended at me using this word, but I'm being honest with you. I cannot do stupid. I have a really, really hard time with stupidity. Uh, and then I see all the stupidity that's going on around me, and I have a problem with it. it. It bothers me a lot, and I have to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me. I know these things are written. I know these things are going to happen, but I still have a hard time with it. And you know what? I'm not the only one that thinks this way or feels this way. There are others like us who see the stupidity going around us and it bothers us. Remember Lot? The Bible says he vexed his righteous soul. There's, there's many of us who feel the same way. But the problem is that we're busy raising our families, working our jobs, taking care of our homes, being citizens while the enemy has crept in and has sowed tears. He sowed tears in the schoolhouse. He sowed tears in the courthouse. He sowed tears in the church house. He so tears in the House of Representatives, tears everywhere, and now these tears are tearing the country apart. I wish I could tell you that everything's going to get better, and I want to tell myself the same thing. But I know the Scriptures, I'm a student of the Scriptures, I know these things were written, and these things have to happen. It's not going to get better. We are ruled by the Uniparty, and they all serve mammon. I've come to the conclusion in the last few years that, that they all promise you the world but deliver nothing. And Elijah was living in a similar environment. The leadership was corrupt. They were worshipping Satan out in the open. Baal worshippers. They had the prophets of Baal. And the many of our elites today in this world, if you haven't looked at it, they're Luciferians. They worship Lucifer as the one true God. I hate to break it to you, but they don't believe and they don't worship the God that you do. That's why they're doing all these things to us. The Bible is clear. Not only that, was the whole land was steeped in Baal worship. The people didn't know who was God. They thought Baal was a true God. And the land of Israel at that time was ruled by a wicked couple. Ahab and Jezebel. And they were actively killing the prophets of God. They were pursuing. They were searching for the prophets of God. And if they found one, they would kill him. Yeah. And the people of God did not know who the real God was. Was it Jehovah or was it Baal? And that's where we are right now. They don't know who the real God is. Is it God or is it science? I was going to say something else, but I'm going to refrain. But the truth was that Elijah was not alone. Do you sometimes feel like Elijah? Perhaps it is time to reassess that you're not alone as you think you are. There's an old story about the devil who was retiring from his work. He wanted to get rid of all his tools. So he had a garage sale and he displayed all his tools with a price tag. There were all kinds of tools like malice, hatred, jealousy, deceit, bitterness, pride, betrayal, 
adultery, cruelty, ungratefulness, and many more. And all of them had their own price tag. Some more expensive than others, depending on their usefulness. But one of them was set apart and marked with the highest price. When the devil was asked why this particular tool was the most expensive, he said, because this is my sharpest and most useful tool. It's called depression. With depression, he said, I can do anything I want to anybody, regardless of their education, their religion, their wealth, or their fame. It always works. It never fails. And the devil had other successful tools. One of those, another one happened to be fear. There are also many things in this life that we fear. Remember, fear is not from God. Fear is from the enemy. Fear of failure. Fear of losing a job. Fear of losing a partner. Fear of losing your friends. Fear of challenges. I simply can't do it. Fear of losing your health. And fear of being alone. Many people think that the first thing that the devil comes to them with is temptation. He wants them to do something real evil, something really bad. But that's not the devil's primary method of attack. I believe when it comes to the Christian, depression is a very powerful tool. But yes. something else he does before you get into that state of depression, he, he tries to isolate you. The devil tries to isolate the Christian and he starts feeding you lies. The church that you go to is not good. The pastor only is interested in money. He doesn't care about you. Uh, your, your friends don't care about you. Nobody cares about you. Why are you going to church? Why are you going to this place where nobody uh, gives you any minute of the day? Then he gets you to a place where you feel alone and unsupported. And all, of, all kinds of lies can take root in your heart during that process. Without the edification and encouragement of truth, the devil, the, the, the devil whispers in your ear that you're a victim, that you're being taken advantage of. Nobody cares for you. Nobody loves you. They only want what you have. And he keeps feeding those lies. The whole purpose, he wants to isolate you. He wants you to feel alone. He wants you to feel lonely. And when you feel alone, you're more likely to further isolate yourself and feed that feeling of loneliness. Elijah left his servant behind. Why did he do that? Why, I, I, when I was reading the passage, I asked myself, why did, he take, why did he bring his servant with him? He was feeling alone. What about his servant? The fact that he was Elijah's servant meant that he too was following God. Why did he dump that guy? He needed his servant next to him more than anything else during that time. He could have used the company. Then he, I think, I, I really believe he left that servant so he can go ahead and mope and, 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 and really feel alone and justify to himself that, hey, I'm the only one. How about your servant? What's he? Uh, minced meat? In Proverbs 18.24, the Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Many versions have distorted this first part of this verse and translated it as, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. Now we're not going to debate the Hebrew because the Hebrew, in the third, there's only three words in the first half of this verse in the Hebrew, man, friends, and then something else that could be translated either way. We're not going to go into the debate by now. But I want you to think about this. Uh, does a man need a lot of friends to be ruined? No, he can ruin himself. He can only have one friend and ruin himself. He doesn't need a lot of friends to be ruined. But in order for you to have a lot of friends, you have to show yourself friendly. You can see how using a different translation will give you a different meaning and will set a different principle in your life. That's why it's important to have the right translation. My, I really believe that with my whole heart. You cannot have many friends if you're antisocial. In 2019, when I went to Greece for my dad's funeral, I got a chance to visit with my cousin. I remember a conversation I had with her, with her husband, about their daughter, my, my niece. And her dad was telling me how she just started college and she was complaining that she didn't have any friends. And her dad says, let me help you, daughter. 
I'm going to give you some advice. And if you follow my advice, you'll, you'll succeed. He, he told her this. This is how you're going to have friends. I want you to find in college five classmates. Five, pick five people at random. And go up to them and nicely ask them, is it okay if I can have your phone number? And he told her, at the end of the day, tell me how many friends you're going to have. He, her dad was basically telling her, you haven't tried. Yeah. You haven't tried. Lonely people who have few or no friends wallow in their own loneliness. The problem is they never show themselves friendly. They never try. They just sit there and mope and say, woe is me. Pick up the phone, call someone. Hey, can we go for coffee? Hey, can we meet? Invite them over for dinner. I'm going to keep myself from saying what I want to say, but I'm going to keep going on. Loneliness is part of the human condition. We all are going to go through times of our lives where we feel lonely. And God knows that. And that's why God gives us examples in the Bible of people who experience loneliness. We talk about the prophet Elijah. He was so lonely. He, was so, he felt so alone that he fell in depression. And because he fell into the depression, he had suicidal thoughts. In 1 Kings 19.4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Perhaps Elijah was expecting a great revival after his showdown with the prophets of Baal. He was, he was expecting the entire nation of Israel to turn to God. And that's what happens to us sometimes. We're on fire for God. We love God. We have a, 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 a thriving relationship with our, with our Creator, with our Savior. And we want that for everybody else. And then we tell them about God. We witness to them. And, they're, and they, they don't care. Oh, great. I'm happy for you. And they go on the merry way and we wonder and say, what's wrong with you? Don't you want to know God? They, the truth is they don't. They, want, they don't want to know God. Sometimes you see a Christian, and I see many Christians, and, and they're living the, the, the lukewarm Christian life, and they don't even see it. And I don't feel like shaking them. I feel like slapping them a little bit. Wake up. What's wrong with you? I'm good. I, I love God. I'm, I'm a good Christian. No, you're not. You can't see it. You're blinded. You can't see it. I, I want to I take the blinders up, but I can't do that. You just got to pray for them and allow the Holy Spirit to keep working in their life so they can see uh, with the path that they're on. David also experienced feelings of loneliness, and he recorded them in the Psalms. In Psalms 25, 16, he said, Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. David felt like he was an island all by himself. In Psalms 142.4 he says, I looked on my right hand and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. He felt alone and dejected. Paul likely to experience loneliness. In Timothy, when he, when he, in his second letter to Timothy, he writes, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Even the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, appears to have experienced loneliness. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, he went back to see his disciples. And where did he find them? Where, how did he find them? They were sleeping. They were asleep. And he said, could you not wait with me for an hour? Could you not pray with me? And the night he was arrested, right before they put the handcuffs on his hands, before the, uh, uh, the policeman threw him in the patrol car, the, the Bible says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Then he was taken to the jail all by himself. And even when he was on the cross, the wrath of God was being poured upon him. The Bible says at that point, he was made sin for us. He became sin for us. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A very, very deep theological question that I believe still today cannot be answered satisfactorily. Perhaps when we get to heaven, God will tell us what happened on that moment when the wrath of God poured upon His own Son, when God poured His wrath upon Himself. Theologians debate whether the, the Trinity was split. And we know that theologically, because of who God is, that cannot be possible. 
But we know in, in his humanity, Christ may have felt isolated and lonely. And if you are listening to my voice right now and you're feeling alone, you are not alone. No pun intended. Uh, you are not alone in the sense that others have felt what you have felt. And that God is there by your side waiting for you to discover him. Waiting for you to turn from your own loneliness to him. Remember God pursued Elijah. And God said to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? Oh God, I'm, I'm licking my wounds. I'm feeling sorry for myself. There are those who have all the friends in the world, but they still feel alone. There are those who are surrounded by lots of family, but they still feel alone. There are those who run large businesses and have uh, many employees, but they still feel alone. There are those who are married, yet they still feel alone. Even with social media, when a friend is a click away, people are still feeling lonely. You know, it's, it's amazing to me how even today you can, you can develop a friendship with someone you've never seen through social media. I find that amazing. Kind of neat in a way. Uh, someone may be quick to say, oh, but you're a Christian, you should never feel alone. That's true because God has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. But even as a Christian, you can't feel alone. The truth is many Christians today struggle with loneliness. And they feel the obligation to show strength and to seek comfort from God. To pretend that they, oh I'm good, I'm, I'm okay, I've God on my side. But deep down they feel terribly alone. And if you find yourself feeling this way, be careful. Because you can enter a downward spiral of guilt, feeling that your faith is not what it should be. You say, I believe in God, I'm a saved person, I'm a saved Christian. Why do I get, why do I still feel so alone? You try to push aside the loneliness because your faith, uh, what you know from the scriptures, what you know from God, tells you that you shouldn't be feeling this way. Yes, I feel alone, but as a Christian, shouldn't I feel comforted and happy anyway? Is my faith so weak? That's why I'm feeling lonely, sad, or overwhelmed? Shouldn't I only tell others how God uh, is even with me when I'm alone, rather than admitting I'm actually really struggling with loneliness? But you can't just come out of loneliness overnight. The first thing you must do is you need to first, uh, on your way to overcoming loneliness, you need to strengthen your relationship with God, who promises never to leave you nor forsake you. And you need to understand uh, that God has, has clearly told you in Scripture that He will always be with you. Genesis 28, 15, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken unto thee. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, He is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31, 8, And the Lord, He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Joshua, Joshua 1, 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Psalm 27, 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 17. When the poor and the needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Matthew 28, 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always unto the end of the world. Amen. In Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he saith, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And this is just a sampling of the verses found in the entire Bible. God has promised to never leave you, that you'll never be alone with God on your side. Remember, Christ was God who came to be with us. While he walked this earth, he held little children in his lap. He loved people. He ate with them. He walked with them. He laughed with them. He cried with them. And then he died for them. He died so that they could never be alone. Only God can completely fill the empty spaces in your life 
and make you completely whole. Christ came to live a life that we may pattern after. Where am I getting with all this? Jesus is our model of what it means to have human relationships. He was born into a traditional family. He made himself subject unto the authority of Joseph and his mother. He launched his ministry by calling others to follow him and, and made them his disciples. Jesus was never a lone ranger. Never. He was left alone right before he was arrested for his crucifixion. But up until then, he was always surrounded with people. He sometimes uh, resorted up to the mountaintops or desolate places or desert places where he would pray alone with the Father. But that, this was only uh, short periods of time when he did that. But for the most part, he was not in solitude. He was not alone. Yes, he prayed alone on the mountains, as we said, and he communed with the Father. The Bible says he went alone to pray. But th those were few and far between, those moments of isolation. Where he was in the and even during that time he was not alone because he was in the company of the Father and the Holy Spirit. If Jesus lived his life having relationships, then it makes sense that we too should live our lives endeavoring to establish relationships. God's desire from the beginning in Exodus 25 8, he said to his, pe his people, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. In Exodus 29.45, And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God. In John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Revelation 21.3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them, and be their God. Without relationships, we will fall into the, into the state of being lonely. Unfortunately, America stands for a lot of good things, but America is also uh, promotes individualism over community. And therefore, it's easier to fall into loneliness in our society. And that's why church is so important. You need to belong to a Christian community, the local church. This is the family in which every Christian should be able to find relief from loneliness. There is a cure from loneliness. The family of God uh, isn't united by blood only, but also by love, which is the very heart of our faith. The local church is the antidote to loneliness. You need a relationship with God. You need to strengthen that relationship with God. You need to find and make relationships with others. And you do that through the setting of the local church, not just entirely in the local church. If you do not avail yourself of this body that God himself has ordained, then why are you living in loneliness? Now it's true that even today churches have fallen into individualism. Members are often forgotten and forsaken. It shouldn't be that way. If you're already part of a local church and you still feel lonely, then ask yourself, what do I need to do to combat this? What should I be doing? What should my part be in this church? Maybe you should start a group. Start visiting some people. I was going to say something about COVID, but I'm going to refrain myself. People expect their pastor to read their minds like some wives expect their husbands to read their minds. Remember, I had a friend of mine, his first, he divorced from his first wife, and she passed soon after from breast cancer, and uh, she would want him to read her mind. She would want him to bring flowers when she wanted, and do this for her, and do that for her. And he finally told her, I'm not like that. I can't read your mind. Tell me what you want. They expect their husbands to Anticipate their needs to remember their birthdays and their anniversaries. Oh, well, you should remember the special days. I mean, that's the <laughs> least thing you can do as a husband. Remember her birthday and remember the anniversary. I know someone who called me a while back, he uh, lives far away from here, and I was talking to them on the phone. He said, the pastor never calls me. And I asked her and I said, when's the last time you went to, ch to church? Uh, does the pastor see you there regularly? Does he think that you're a member of the church? Does he know that you want to be part of the church? Sometimes when you get a visitor and once in a while, you want to give them their space. You don't want to overwhelm them. But before I asked her this, I asked her, does he have a family? Is he a full-time pastor? Does he have a job? Did you ever consider that he's a busy man? Maybe you should reach out to him if, you're, if, you, want his, if you want to meet with him, if you want him to meet with you. 
Perhaps he doesn't see you in church as often and he figures you're not interested and he doesn't want to violate your privacy. Did you ever think about these things? If you don't show any interest, then why do you expect the others to show interest to you? You take the initiative. Don't expect the other person to take the initiative. Oh, I'm lonely, nobody cares about me. Well, why don't you take the initiative? Why don't you sit and say, hey, can we talk? In the family, everyone is responsible for building and strengthening relationships. Don't wait for someone else to take action while you're dealing with loneliness. Sometimes they may not know what you're going through. Don't expect them to read your mind. It may be that they're not aware of what you're going through. Communicate. I tell people that when, I want, when I'm going through something, I want people to know. I want more people to pray for me. I tell them, oh, I'm a private person. I mean, yeah, you can keep some details private, but there's nothing wrong with telling your brother or sister in Christ, say, hey, uh, I'm going through some things right now. Uh, with my child, can you please pray for us? You don't have to give them all the little details, but reach out to them. Reach out to your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I would. I want them to pray for me. Don't be so proud that you refuse to reach out to someone and ask for help. Uh, they should know what I'm going through. They should know what I'm feeling. No, no, they don't. Only God does. It's true as Christians were called by Christ to care for one another. And we need to help someone who is dealing with loneliness. We need to love them. But you also need to do your part. The early church operated as a community. And they loved and served one another. They broke bread in each other's homes daily. Acts 2.46 And they, continuing daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They hung out with each other every day. You face great danger when you isolate yourself. You're falling into the devil's trap. Oh, no, I'm not. I spend time with God. But you fail to see that God has called you not to isolate, but to participate. You may justify your actions and say, well, I'm spending my time with God, I'm communing with God. But God has called you to be part of the local church and to do your part in that local church. Right. If you fail to do that, you're disobeying the Lord and you don't even see it. Yes, there are times when you and I to be alone with God. And yes, sitting in silence with God can help you refocus on Him and learn how to depend on Him more. And having a strong connection with God enables you to cope better with feelings of loneliness by focusing your attention away from yourself and toward God. But this should be done periodically, and it's not the, the pattern of life. The pattern of life was set for us by Christ Himself. He had relationships. He interacted with people. In fact, uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha was, were dear friends to His. Every time He passed by, He'd stop at their house, and they got dinner together. The local church depends on your involvement. The church can only grow as fast as the slowest member. Isolation also sets you up as a target for the devil. Right. And as you surround yourself with like-minded, spirit-soaked, joy-filled believers, Satan loses power over you because they remember to pray for you and your faith is strengthened. Now, the best way to be convinced of the fullness of Jesus' love is to know Him deeply through others. You and I are made to connect, to start cultivating. So start cultivating the soil of friendship which, and watch your loneliness disappear. It's the only way. In Romans chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, listen to what Paul says. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, that you may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That's how lowliness is, is, is fought. You have to cultivate relationships among the brothers and sisters in Christ. The story is told of a time when D.L. Moody was visiting a prominent Chicago citizen with the idea of church membership and involvement. It came up in, during the conversation. The man invited Moody in and they went to, and sat at the man's parlor. It was winter and there was a coal fire burning in the fireplace. And Moody inquired about the man's lack of, of church attendance. And the man responded and he said this, I believe I can be uh, just as good a Christian outside the church as I can be inside it, the man said. And that's the justification many have today. And Moody just sat there quietly and listened to the man. He didn't say anything, but instead he got up and he moved closer to the fireplace. And the fire was blazing against the cold outside. Then he took the tongs that were by the fireplace 
and he removed one coal that was burning, and he placed it on the hearth. He took one coal, and he placed it on the hearth, and he went back and he sat down again, and he didn't say a word. Both men sat together and watched the ember die out. Eventually, the man turned to Moody and said, I see, I'll be in church next Sunday. God promised to never leave you. God has given you the comfort of the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. God has also given you the local church. And he tells you, be a part of it. God says that the church can only operate as long as each member does their part. It's in the scripture. A Christian has all the tools to never feel lonely. Hopefully what I've given you this morning, if you are experiencing loneliness, I've given you some tools to overcome it. Strengthen your relationship with God. Establish relationships. Seek out relationships. And be part, be an active part of your local church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for this message, Lord God. We know, Father, that we all experience bouts of loneliness in our lives. It's the human condition. It's the human experience. You've given us examples of men and women in the Bible who have experienced loneliness. But also, Lord God, you have not left us. You've told us that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you've given us the tools to combat loneliness. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that is feeling lonely, may you minister into their heart. May they, may they take some steps, Lord God, to overcome this feeling. I pray you help your people this morning. If there's anyone... Who listens to this? Who is listening to this message at a later time? I pray that you can seek the Lord God for help in fighting your loneliness. Remember, you're not alone in feeling lonely. I pray God you help your people, and thank you for this message this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.